we're certainly taking a turn, but thanks for joining us. Uh, have an exciting session around global payments today with uh, four exceptional companies. Uh, my name is Solomon Hailu. I'm one of the partners at March Capital. I spend my, a lot of my time uh, covering fintech for us. Um, and global payments has been a, a very exciting area for the last, I would say, two decades, mainly because how uh, dispersed technology has been when you look at it from a global sense. We've seen the emergence of real-time payments, virtual cards, software integrating itself within payment businesses and the broader landscape. Uh, so that's where we'll really be spending time today. Um, in addition, we'll discuss what will kind of drive the next wave of innovation, um, how the business model of payments is, is shifting, uh, again, to incorporate more software into a broader platform, uh, and some of the key challenges and barriers as we uh, look ahead. Uh, so joining me are four uh, awesome companies. Uh, to my right, we have Andrew Jamieson, CEO of Extend, Jen Liu, CFO of Tala, um, John Lun, CFO of Gravy, and Klaus Back, uh, CEO of Pagos. Um, so to kick off, it'd be great for each of you to give a, just a brief introduction on yourself, your company, uh, and kind of the customer you serve today. Perfect, thanks, Sol. Uh, so I'm Andrew Jamison, CEO of Extend. Um, we have uh, gone and built over the top of sort of the traditional legacy credit card issuing infrastructure to enable the traditional banks with more digital capabilities, initially about virtual cards, uh, and then more broadly around how we help small middle market businesses with spend management. So we serve about 6,500 businesses, uh, and we essentially are helping banks grow to the tune of about $5 billion so far, but it's a $1.7 trillion market, so a huge opportunity in front of us helping to serve those traditional banks. Thanks. I'm Jen Liu, CFO at Tala. Uh, we are global fintech actually just down the street in Santa Monica, but we service what we call the global majority, and that's the 4 billion people around the world that actually are largely overlooked by traditional institutions. We don't serve the poorest of the poor who are covered by governments and NGOs, and we don't service the middle class and above who are really targeted by legacy financial institutions. Rather, it's the four billion emerging middle class. Um, we offer, first and foremost, a credit product um, coupled with instant payments and savings really to, to give folks financial access that they didn't have before. Um, yeah. Wonderful. And uh, hello, I'm John Lund. I'm not the CFO because I can't add up. I'm a CEO, just, just so we know. Uh, oh, but, uh, did I say CFO? <laughs> Sorry, I'm a CEO. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm from a company called Gravy. We're a payments orchestration platform. Um, um, our mission is to empower merchants in the payment stack. So um, there's a long line of people who take cuts as payments happen, and ultimately the merchants who are, are the people who end up paying for it. And uh, we believe they should have much more control of that payment stack and how they run it. Um, and so we're on a mission to empower the merchants. We're connected to pretty much every payment company in the world, and we offer a layer that allows the merchant to make choices and move between payment stacks, payment companies, without an army of engineers. All right, and I'm Klaus, I'm with Pogos. We also work mostly with merchants. We help them be data-driven by using their payments data to get insight about how can they sell more, where can they reduce their costs, then monitor that data over time, and then provide tools that helps them capitalize on that and actually drive more outcome from a top line and bottom line perspective. Jen, maybe we can kind of start with you, given uh, Tala operates in the emerging markets and what you've seen at, in terms of payment adoption uh, across you know, the four uh, countries you're, you're in. Um, it may be shocking to hear, but, but the U.S. is not the most sophisticated when it comes to payments. We've actually seen emerging markets uh, already leapfrog the U.S. In some cases, they're about to. Um, as you noted, we're in four markets, Kenya, Philippines, Mexico, and India. Kenya actually had a mobile wallet launched nearly two decades ago. That's actually why we entered Kenya first, because there was this infrastructure through which we could reach a vast majority of the adult population. Um, India, eight years ago, the government launched uh, UPI, which is an instant interoperable payment transfer infrastructure, which I think has really changed uh, digitization in the country. Um, 
last year, I think they had almost 120 billion transactions flow through UPI. And even in countries like Mexico and Philippines that have historically been more cash-based, post-COVID, we've seen a massive digitization and shift towards comfort, um, people's comfort kind of around using digital solutions, including for their financial transactions. So that's something that Tala really tracks along and ensures that we're, we're bridging that cash and digital uh, gap and ensuring that as the payments infrastructure evolves, we are delivering um, what customers need, where they want it, and that no one's left behind. Yeah, and I think just to expand on the Kenya point, I just think it's so remarkable. 70% uh, of Kenya's GDP flows through M-Pesa, which is a mobile, mobile money, uh, which is incredible when you think about it compared to the US. Um, and Andrew, you're, you're working a lot of, with a lot of US financial institutions. Maybe you can touch on some of the legacy technical challenges uh, in terms of upgrading, um, specifically on the card front. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I started my career for the first 10 years. I was actually working with SAP. And to age myself, it was the mid-90s, and I was working on a green screen. But by 96, it already moved to a client-server environment. right? And so the whole world started to operate right around EDI and connectivity. Wind the clock forwards 20, 30 years almost now, actually. And you see that the, the, the banks are still using mainframes. Right? They're still using green screens. And that's where we've had a lot of challenges with innovation. Now, I think that PSD2 and legislation in, in Europe and, and UK and others have really opened up right, the ecosystem for fintechs to start to partner with banks. Uh, and that's <clears throat> really what's allowed us right, to go and wrap ourselves around the legacy infrastructure and offer up a modern suite of APIs. And those APIs really help those banks right, propel themselves into the digital era. And we do that, why? Because actually small and middle market companies have been massively underserved. They've been offered either right, a consumer product with lipstick that says now it's a business card, or they've been offered an enterprise scale platform which requires someone with a computer science degree to go and operate. And so if you're a company with less than 250 employees, you actually didn't have a solution that allowed you to actually operate your business efficiently at a good price point. And that's where we've really stepped in and said, okay, let's re-orchestrate all of this on behalf of the banks and let's partner with the incumbents. And the reason why I think that's interesting versus trying to burn down Rome is the reality is in the commercial credit card space, as I mentioned, it's a $1.7 trillion market. You take some of the newer players, like the Rams and the Brexes, and at best, you're at 25 billion. So your rounding error is still in the ecosystem, right? There's, 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 just a, there's tens of millions of physical cards out there through which we can then essentially promote this digital infrastructure and spend management capabilities. And that, that's the game that we're in, and we're a little bit different relative to others in that space. Klaus, John, you work more on the, on the merchant side, and you both highlighted uh, the challenges around better data, connectivity. Um, how do you kind of view the landscape uh, when you're serving your, your clients and merchants? It's hard. It's complicated, right? And I think part of the reason we exist is we wish every payment company in the world had the same API. They don't. The truth is everyone is different. And you know, we talked about UPI. There's PIX in Brazil. Then you go to all the, all the wallets, et cetera. They're not all the same. They don't even operate in the same way. So when you're a, a merchant or a retailer and going to a, a new country, it is quite hard to adapt your payment for that country. And, and you know, I've had so many conversations with US customers launching in Europe. And I'm like, oh, so you're doing Germany. What payment types are you taking? Oh, we're taking cards. I'm like, you know less than 50% of Germans even own credit cards? I'm like, no, really? I'm like, there, there is a wide world out there. So I think part of our mission is really to make that a lot easier, to simplify it so that you can serve your customers better and allow them to pay the way they want to pay. Yeah, and I, I think on our side, just trying to help companies make sense of all the data to what we already have heard here, it, I would say any merchant or company selling or billing online, their infrastructure is getting more complicated, they have more vendors, they're probably going global faster than they would have done 10 years ago, so it just leads to a lot of complexity and it's complicated to manage and very expensive uh, and we help them to 
trying to understand where, where are the opportunities, where can we do more. Uh, as an example, we, everyone likes to talk about new countries, but if you take a market like the US, the data that you send with the payment transaction impacts both the likeliness of the transaction actually going through. A lot of people take that for granted, but that is not so. And the other one is also the data you send or don't send impact your cost, it impacts the exchange from a card perspective, and that could be quite material. In fact, for many companies, the payment cost is the second biggest line item on their balance sheet after employees. So moving the needle there can be quite material. And, and they, most merchants don't know. They don't know. They don't know how much money they're leaving on the table. And, uh, in, and you'll give them a report, and they then have the ability to go and change it. But when we do ROI calculation on merchants, they are saving millions by optimizing their payment system, and they just didn't know they could before. I, th I think the. The hard thing for people to grasp is actually the US is the anomaly in this whole equation, <laughs> right? And, and a lot of that's to do with regulation. Europe has enforced more regulation, right, at, at the sort of European level, at the country level. One of the things that I learned when I came to the US in 2006 was actually the US operates like 50 countries, right? You, you need to have a money movement license in every one of the states. Mm -hmm. And the reality is we're still mired in checks, right, in, in the country. It's like, go find another country that has the size and scale of payments happening on paper. It, it's quite extraordinary. But until right, you have, in my mind, a tipping point of a need to change, we're going to be left a little bit in, in this world, which creates lots of opportunity. There's no doubt about it. And there's, this is still the biggest opportunity right, that there is out there on, on the marketplace. But that's a little bit where, where the struggles are happening. Yeah. And I will say, I mean, the U.S. is making efforts. We have FedNow, and if, you know, we've been building real-time payment networks. A lot of that is dependent on consumer adoption and interest in the product and some security challenges that are also presented by money moving faster. Um, kind of what, what is the panel's view on if we continue to modernize and work with what we have versus making more of a paradigm shift? Uh, Uh, look, I'll, I'll jump in here. We've had open banking in Europe for a number of years now. It is slowly getting adopted. I think a lot of people expect you to release a real-time banking infrastructure system into a market where there's already working payment systems. It is not going to get the adoption of UPI. It's not going to get adoption of PIX, but it will get adoption. It's just going to take a lot longer. Yeah. And so I think part of it is consumer experience. Is it easier? Is it simpler? No. Not yet. Um, but uh, is it cheaper? Yes. So how do you incentivize the merchants to preference it, and how do you make it attractive? Like, is it quicker to pay with an open banking system in Europe, or Apple Pay is definitely quicker to pay with Apple Pay? So as a consumer, I will choose Apple Pay. Yeah, I mean, I, I would add to that. There's quite a few factors. It doesn't necessarily always have to be consumer driven, right? You can have regulatory changes uh, that drives it, some of the payment methods in some of the countries that we already mentioned in Brazil or India or whatever have you that have been driving change. It, it could also be that, as an example, Apple Pay and Google Pay rise on the mobile rails. Conceptually, if you were not a mobile first company going back six, seven, eight years ago, you would have found a situation where I used to have my customer coming in on the website. They're now coming in on other channels. And by the way, that's not just one channel. It's the iOS stack. It's the Android stack. It's the mobile web, if you're big enough. And on that channel, people are not buying as much as they used to. So if I don't fix that, I'm going to have a big problem. And I think um, both those or these payment methods, Apple in, in particular, make it incredibly easy to be a first-time consumer coming in on their mobile app or, let's say, book so, uh, something, so food delivery or whatever have you, and just click here, and you're ready to go. You can pay. Uh, and just makes it easy. So is that an option, or is it convenient? And use something else on top of payment that drives it easy to forget. Same thing with buy now, pay me later over the last six, seven years. Like a lot of people get easy access to, to more credit. And that's been the driver and the function of that. Transactions are moving to different types of payments brand than before. I think the reality, though, is we have to, we have to recognize that just because there's a better rail doesn't mean it gets adopted. People forget that someone has to do the conversion, right? And it's the same way as if you move from one system to the other system, someone has to do the migration. And, and I think in every case, everyone turns around and looks at the other person and says, well, you're doing it, right? <laughs> Mr. Corporate, you're, you're going to do it. And the corporate goes, no, 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 I, I've, I've optimized my own 
uh, AP operations, so no, I don't have staff to go and collect ACH and routing numbers and validate that they're actually a company's ones and not the individual's ones, right? So people forget mm -hmm. that there's manpower needed in conversion, right? And it's like all these great projects that we do in IT, we all know if there isn't good change management, nothing actually happens, right? So I think that's the thing we've got to stay away from. Mm -hmm. And John, I'd love to get your perspective from kind of the emerging market lens, but um, as, as you think about innovation in fintech over the last few years, uh, you know, we've seen uh, fast rise, crypto getting hot again, applications of stable coin. Is there any new technology you think will accelerate Tala even faster in the emerging markets? Yeah, so, so technology is always first on our mind. Um, you know, we had AI from day one, right? Our, our machine learning is really at the core of our credit underwriting, um, identity verification. It is also, um, it influences our customer engagement strategies and so forth. So what's the next technology for us? Um, we actually do see blockchain as being really interesting. Um, you know, I think in terms, it, it's changing how money moves around the world and certainly within our markets uh, across borders. It's reducing costs of those transactions and it's, creating a new paradigm around trust that puts it more in the individual's hands rather than legacy institutions. So we're actually experimenting with that to see how we could change our infrastructure um, and help us get to our goal of, of servicing more of the global majority faster and easier. I think the thing for us is, you know, we're always looking at new technologies, but we wanna be very careful that we're not just going after the latest fad. Um, we really are looking for things that fundamentally accelerate our ability to, to deliver a greater financial inclusion and make sense for our customers. Because I think everyone sort of touched on this. If the end user is not going to find it easier or cheaper, it may not be very useful. So, so that's what we have to balance as we assess different kinds of technology. Well, it wouldn't be a tech conference without talking about AI. Uh, and I think there's a natural connection between with, um, Klaus and John were saying around data. Um, you know, there's structured, there's a lot of structured data and payments, some unstructured. How do you think about AI as a technology moving your businesses forward and kind of shifting the landscape? Yeah, so we've talked to our clients a lot about AI and uh, the, their uh, hunger or, or will to use AI. And what we're hearing back is it's interesting, but I don't trust it to run my money. And so I think, well, when, when we ask them, if we were to use AI, where would you be comfortable? And there's something in AI called explainable AI. And explainable AI will make a decision, but also tell you every single step it took to get to that decision. And I think our merchants are interested in explainable AI, but with the controls to, to tweak it for their own business models. So I think it's gonna be, look, in FinTech, we've been using AI for years and years. I wrote. Uh, models 15, 20 years ago and anti-fraud technology using what's now called AI, right? It's machine learning then. So it's been around a long time. We've been using it a long time. You've, you've used it, whether you've known it or not. I think when it comes to um, actually making clear decisions on behalf of a merchant, we've got some confidence to build there. We've got, we've got to get people comfortable with it first. Yeah, I, I think on our side, it, it's kind of two buckets. One is helping us build and operate uh, companies or products more efficiently than maybe you would have been able to do a few years ago. So there's that, there's some complexity uh, around that or doing it at scale versus fun little projects uh, at, at this point, especially with some of the AI tools. But on the other side, from a kind of client facing perspective, we, we have a lot of data and machine learning in particular helps us kind of breaking down that in, in slices to different use cases uh, or it could be, I don't really know what I've been looking for. Can you surface the most important things? Or I come to work today, what happened over the last 24 hours? And I don't want to go look for it. Actually, easier to build technology where you can surface that automatically. I don't know what I should be looking at. Or if I am looking at something, what does it mean? And researching that or doing something about it, just much more easier than you could ever possibly build 10 years ago. When you're working with merchants, what, what is the biggest bottleneck around using their data better? Um, uh, on our side, uh, I would say people don't have the data, or if they have the data, it's tucked away somewhere, or it's old, so just getting access is the stepping stone. You, yeah, the way I like to think about it, if you don't look at the data, you really don't have a problem, because you can just say, hey, I lost $2 million last year, and I'm losing $2 million 
this year or even every month or every week, whatever have you, it's only when that starts to change that people start noticing. But what if you knew that there was $2 million you could have addressed, very different behavior. So the biggest stepping stone is just people are actually having the data and being able to look at it. Then there are other complexities with like, okay, well, what does it mean, which is a different topic altogether. But just getting access to real-time data is pretty hard. So. Uh, on, on, on an adjacent front, you know, as more technology is coming up, uh, Jen, you mentioned kind of security. Um, I think, Andrew, you can tell us more about kind of your approach to that in terms of embedding virtual cards into software offerings to offer better security and control. But how do you think about the, the shifting landscape in terms of more technology producing more risk for uh, different users? Look, I think that's why we're going to a world where all payments become tokenized. Right, and, and the world we're in, a virtual card is a token, right? And so the fraud levels are minimal, right, compared to other sort of traditional card payments, right? They're, they're truly minuscule because they're short lived, they're very specific amounts. Um, but I think it's now more and more about how you embed those services. Um, and I think that's where we're going to start to see a real, real evolution, right? We see it a lot in the consumer level, right, with the embedding. It's been around for a long time, but this B2B embedding is just not even existent today. And I think that's, that's where we're going to start to see real shifts. People want to be in an existing workflow, an existing experience, and essentially have right, all of the security layers built into that, right? and, and therefore be able to manage an end-to-end -end process that satisfies the office of the CFO, which says, like, and my ledgers are also updated, and yes, the payment was taken care of, it was secure, the merchant got the funds, they allocated the funds correctly, et cetera, et cetera, which goes back to the AI piece, right? which is, it's all about data, the real question, I think, though, is, is going back to that, is who owns the data, right? So we signed a, a, an interesting partnership with SAP Concur, and we're like, great, you have lots of merchant data, it's basically, or, or, or supplier data, I should say, and then you go back and say, okay, but which one's a merchant? No idea. And you say, well, how about we use your data? And they go, ah, oh, even we as Concur don't own the data. So you need consent. So we're, sort of, we're all tripping over each other. I think in, in that particular space to bring some of this innovation, to bring some of the security, right, to bring right, the, the benefits of AI. Uh, there's, there's not been a really coordinated effort in that space. I, th I think that like, there's a, a big thing happening in payments in the moment, that's authentication. So if you walk into a store with a piece of plastic and you hand over that piece of plastic, what that merchant is charged is less than if you use the same piece of plastic online because the view is it's more secure if a person's got a card and a signature. I don't believe that's true anymore. And I think we're getting to a point where, especially with uh, mobile devices, fingerprint, logging, everything that's coming with this new delegated auth, as it's being called, is actually more secure than if you walked into a store. So why are you paying more still online than you are in store? That should change, and that fundamentally changes a lot of what we're doing in payments. It changes anti-fraud, it changes subscriptions, changes a whole load of stuff, and I think that's gonna shake up payments quite a lot over the next few years. And do you find that, uh, sorry, we're good. No, no, we're good, thank you. Uh, in terms of gravy working across countries, uh, are any, any market better than others in terms of where you found uh, I mean, there's first movers, right? I think you look at the open banking system in Europe, and lots of people are using open banking to authenticate people because they're, you know, the banking apps are some of the most secure apps out there for obvious reasons. So if you can authenticate someone with their banking app, that's great. You've, you've got a pretty damn good chance they are who they say they are. And in other countries, you're starting to get that. There's some lagging behind. I mean, I always, I always laugh many years ago. I was working on a project in Ireland, and um, you know, when people at the time moved houses in Ireland, they never updated their address because they always had the same postman, and he knew that Mrs. Jones had moved a few houses down. And so you're trying to build an authentication system based on addresses, give up, it's not gonna work. So it's just a, that there are different you know, systems out there, but I think it's getting a lot stronger and a lot mm -hmm. better. Jen, when you think about authentication in kind of emerging markets, uh, Tala, in, in, in some ways, is a closed-loop network where you're, you're uh, providing a wide array of financial products. How do you think about underwriting and, and kind of risk management? Um, I love what everyone's talked about in terms of all the data. It, it's exactly, so the shift in payments and the digitization of payments is actually creating a new data source for us. Historically, we've leveraged Android, uh, very structured Android data. Um, but as more moves through 
people's smartphones, we actually learn a lot from, from that. So I think, um, actually, that, that is also a really big reason why we want to be building in payment features. It's convenient for the consumer because end-to-end -end they can get their credit, they can seamlessly use it, often at cheaper costs, but on the back end, we learn more about them with which to underwrite. So um, that has been, I think, that will continue to be very transformative. And one thing I, I'd like to spend time on is, um, you know, the business model of payments has really evolved. Um, in this day and age, it's hard to just be a processor. You, you have to introduce software. Um, if you look at a strategic like MasterCard, they've been investing heavily in cyber. Even if you look at Stripe or Adyen, they have a wide variety of SaaS offerings. Uh, Klaus, maybe start with you, because you spent time at Braintree and you've been in the payment space for a while. How do you, how do you see the business model itself kind of shifting as you think about vertical software and, and introducing um, more offerings outside of just payment processing? Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess there's a big part of the market that's still the way it always been and kind of payments being tied to banking, et cetera. But, the slice of, of the rest of the market, whether I think of a software builder coming in and kind of taking part of the payment and building it into the flow that's obviously getting bigger and bigger. And there are literally thousands of companies, whether it's a traditional um, uh, software company or a SaaS company that are now embedding payments and making it most likely a better experience, both for the merchant and maybe their customers. Uh, but you also have other companies like in Uber, uh, traditionally, you would probably pay cash in, in the transportation mode or, or, or pay with credit cards if you were lucky. Uh, now is all that baked into the experience or um, an Airbnb world without Airbnb was often writing checks or whatever have you. So there are so many different companies that are now building payments part of the experience and that's a pretty big part. And then the third category, you obviously have companies such as Braintree, PayPal, Stripe and Audion in particular where in, instead of providing a dial tone for payments, there is a significant chunk of software that comes with the payment processing. So if I'm head of product or head of engineering, I can say, do I need a dial tone or do I need a bunch of things to better run my marketplace or to better do underwriting or to better make transaction go through? So just more opportunities to buy a bigger piece of what needs to be done in order to operate more successfully. Andrew, how about uh, from, from your side where, you know, some of the companies we mentioned are more startups that have kind of grown up and introduced uh, payments. How do you, you know, SAP is a, a huge ERP system. I don't know what they think about payments. How do you think about traditional large software platforms thinking about payments as a core competency or a complement? Yeah, look, I think increasingly payments without software is it's just a commodity, right? And so I think you've got to build software around that experience. Or, and, that's, and I think that's a lot for small business and middle market, the challenge you have in large business is they've already curated a set of experiences, right? They've already said, we're using, you know, SAP Concur for our invoicing. We might be using, you know, essentially Concur for travel. And so the last thing they need, again, for security reasons, is yet another user experience with other authentications because they've actually sold for that at an enterprise level. And so for us, as we think about going into the large market segment, it's actually, you need to be where your client already is. And, and the importance there is to make sure that in the same way as when I order an Uber, the payment's in there, the same thing as if I'm ordering something through that software tool, the, the payment better be part of it. And the challenge software companies have had, especially in the world of, of the, the credit cards uh, space, is actually there's never been a standard in the industry for issuing credit cards. There's a standard for ACH called Nacha. There's a standard for International called Wire. Right? You could say Zelle created a peer-to-peer -peer model. Right? You could say there's NISO methods from merchants to go and process credit cards. But actually, on the card issuing side, every bank does it differently. And so it created, actually, an impossible situation for software companies, hence why you think you saw a lot of software companies start to experiment with doing their own issuance, because they kind of got fed up with the ecosystem. Um, and so. And it came to us really uh, only because we started partnering with more and more banks, and we suddenly realized, actually, we do have the one API that connects through to issuance to all of these different uh, players. And, and I think that's the, way, that's the wave of the future, which is actually provide a simple and managed service to these software pies. Again, it's not just about the pipes. It's like you better make sure those pipes are operating and up, 
and, and, and essentially delivering the service they're supposed to do because these software companies don't want to do that piece either, right? So you have to be that middleware. The orchestration layer becomes really key. Uh, next, I think if we, we have some time up here, um, when you think about kind of the barriers to getting there uh, in terms of innovation, um, I mean, regulatory it kind of is kind of a natural one that kind of touches everyone. Um, it'd be helpful to think it, what you think are the biggest challenges in terms of accelerating innovation uh, and what you're kind of balancing that with, um, just kind of open. Klaus, you want to? Oh, uh, yeah, I can go. I mean, I, and there, there's many ways of slicing that. You, you obviously, I, I would say many, especially if you're a global company, there's a lot of regulation, a lot of change. Some of that is just driving things such as compliance that would put an overhead on what you need to do. Some of it is like in, in Europe, you're very likely if you're selling online and you're accepting credit card to use a technology called 3D Secure. So two-factor authentication, you basically need to connect with your issuing bank in order for the transaction to get through. Seems simple, uh, somewhat regulatory driven, very hard to execute. So a tiny thing that suddenly impacts what's your revenue, what's your conversion of people that you spend a lot of money coming into the website to trying to buy something. So just a lot of factors. And then you have all the internal components. I, I have a legacy system. I'm migrating that to the cloud. Maybe I'm working with someone like John to, to make that happen. But all those things just blocks uh, your ability to pick up some of the new things. Because often, companies haven't been able to do well on the fundamentals yet. Then the market's already moving on to something else is required for external reasons or for internal reasons. I mean, so when we talk to merchants, they've usually got a wish list, which is like multi-pages long, stuff they'd like to get it done. And then there's the things they are, need to get done because maybe something's changing with regulation, maybe there's something changing from the card associations. So generally, we will go and sit down with a merchant and we'll say, show us your list, all right? We can help you cross off X percent. And I think a lot of this is resource, right? There is a shortage of payments experts in the world. There's a shortage of payment engineers in the world. And most companies have got other problems right now uh, that they need to deal with urgently. And all the stuff they'd like to do gets put at the bottom of the list. And that's part of the reason we created this company. I just got frustrated. It was how hard it was for people to get stuff done. Yep. And, yeah, okay. I would just add one more thing. If you're big enough uh, and you accept cards in, uh, online uh, from Visa, Moscow, American Express, as an example, Every quarter they put, push out changes, giant binder of a lot of information that you need to go through that may impact your cost, and that could be so material to your public, it would impact your earnings if you're unlucky, or if there are things you need to do that are impacting the number of transactions that actually will successfully process. So just staying on top of something that everyone takes for granted yeah. can sometimes be more than the resources people have in-house. And do you think, uh, as a result, there would be more fintech partnerships between strategics and fintechs? Um, if you look back, there was, you know, I would say that hyper growth period of fintech, you had a lot of partner banks partner and not necessarily know what they were signing up for. Uh, so how do you think about kind of this next chapter in terms of partnering with uh, existing institutions, whether that's to reduce regulatory uh, scrutiny or also just kind of grow the, grow the pie? I think for sure the this, this space has grown big enough where the regulators have started to, to really show a keen interest, right? You think of buy now, pay later and loan stacking and the fact that it wasn't regulated like a, like a consumer product, right? I think that people have recognized there's a challenge right there and it's just one of many. And then, yeah, there was, I think there's a lot of questions around were these fintechs really doing KYC or not in, in, in the real way? And so suddenly they had a portfolio of customers that were not really lined up with the bank charter. And so they had to unwind those, those relationships. So I think, look, we're moving money. We're dealing with money. So regulation is key. And there's a reason why 80% you know, of a bank's budget in IT goes against compliance, because they have to maintain those, those guardrails in place. So to your question, do I think it's going to continue growing? 100%. Uh, and that's because at the end of the day, I think also banks have come to the conclusion that as we go to more and more verticalized solutions, they cannot hope right, to keep up with every one of those things, right? Management changes every 18 months. Priorities change every 18 months, right? Their, their ability to pivot and change just doesn't come, and their decision-making takes too long. 
Um, so I think, I think partnerships are, are very much going to continue to grow and scale. Because at the end of the day, what the bank recognizes, they're here to lend. And that's their core business. And so it's really about how they access different channels into, into those lending streams is, is the most important. And on the, on a, from a global perspective, how yeah, would you view it? I, I think from our end, um, consumer demands are increasing, right? And so we only have limited resources. We can't build everything ourselves. So partnership is a great way to further evolve our feature set. Um, it is a way in some cases to navigate regulatory, but I think it helps us figure out what we need to buy versus build. Um, we start with how do we get this XYZ to market faster? Partnerships is often the mechanism to do that. Um, and then if we see that it is in fact accretive to the customer experience and customer value prop, it may be something we want to ultimately build in-house. But it's a great way for us to balance resources. Yeah. And then in the news recently was uh, Capital One Discover kind of getting announced. Um, you think that's beneficial for the industry? Do you see more consolidation happening? Uh, you know, you all play in different areas of the market, but I think everyone would like to know. <laughs> I think it's a massive opportunity. When you think of where Capital, came, where Capital One came from and its sort of roots, it was you know, online card issuance to an underserved population and what they've become today, it's been very systematic in terms of how they've grown. Um, and clearly whether it's cost savings by owning a network uh, that goes in there, but also recognizing the benefits of a closed loop network and, and having spent 12 years at Amex, I very much firsthand see the value of having a direct relationship between merchants and also the corporate customers and how you think about pricing and orchestrating right, pricing that's actually related to that customer with that supplier. And, and I think that's where there's massive opportunity for them in that particular space. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll go, all right. I mean, there, there's uh, many dimensions to that. One could be somewhat regulatory driven, you can argue that Capital One and, and Discover is, is driven around that besides general growth ambitions. Um, you, you have the software builders that are taking bigger slices of the payment processing, but for them, maybe totally different addition makes sense. So they want to roll up other companies to do more, a little bit to the point earlier. I mean, if you go back a few years, there would be very rare, if any, companies that are doing both payments in and payment out. Now there are many that do card acquiring and card issuing at the same point, as an example. Um, I think you have the legacy acquirers that maybe were part of a bank historically, or a bank organization, or even a spin-out or a payment processor, where they have different dynamics, so they're doing financial rollouts to buy their competitors to operate at a, at a different scale and therefore get leverage on, on the cost side as a way of competing. So there's a lot of opportunities, and to some degree it always is, but there's definitely a lot of change coming up in terms of companies merging or some other companies arising and buying the other guys around them. So. I'd, I'd actually argue, actually, the bigger danger, by the way, for here is, is for the fintechs, not for the banks, right? Because you lose your go-to-market motion, right? And so I think there's, what you have to make sure is if you partner with those banks, there's hooks in there, because I think there's a graveyard of companies that thought that, you know, that they'd hit the, the mother load by having a partnership go there only to see the products that sit there on the sideline because banks have 40, 50, 60, 70 different products to sell. And how do you get it on the scorecard of the right person to then essentially go and drive it? Are they getting paid for it? Are they incentivized to do it? So those are things still big question marks in my mind in some of these collaborations and partnerships, right? To make sure that's what's gonna drive growth if these partnerships lead to collaborations that are mutually accretive, right? To the both, the, both businesses. I think I kind of, I've seen it happen many, many times over the years. You've got a, a bank moving at the speed of the bank, and then they acquire a fast-moving Ferrari, take that Ferrari and put it in a bus lane. They're like, why are you no longer fast? You're like, ah. <laughs> so there is, there's like a little bit of that, and I think like, I think every large fintech in the world considered buying Discover at some stage. Like it was on everyone, every slide deck at some stage, and I was surprised that they got bought by Capital One. It makes a lot of sense. Is it good for the industry? It's not good for the consumer, I don't think, but I think for the industry, probably is a good thing. Got it. Can you just expand on why it's not good for the consumer, or from your side? Well, there's a, f a few different ways. I think one, having one ginormous company is yeah. going to reduce, uh, reduce optionality for you. Um, I think the other thing is Durban, 
uh, basically debit uh, is regulated through Durban unless it's a closed loop network. So if you're a Capital One, you now put your debit through your own Discover thing and you're out of Durban so you can charge more money. So that's not great for the consumer. Got it. Well, uh, I think we let it hit a lot of key things. Um, I would say kind of opening it up to you in terms of anything we may have missed um, or anything you want to leave the audience with as you're kind of thinking about building and, and global payments. Andrew, you can go first. Look, I think, I think we're in an interesting time because of the massive shift in focus we've just seen, right, from fintech to AI. Um, I think we're gonna see a tremendous amount of, of M&A coming through in the next nine to 12 months, right, as valuations sort of get sort of leveled out, as funding starts to dry out, right? I think whilst interest rates are high, there's just a lot of nervousness in the ecosystem, right, in terms of where people wanna put their money. Uh, and I think as a result of it, some, some good fintechs will go by the wayside. Um, and, and won't reach their maximum potential. Uh, and so yes, I think some will be acquired, then it's a case of like, do they end up buying a Ferrari that goes in the bus lane? And we've seen that story play out many, many times before. Um, so my, the watch out for me is, is a little bit around sort of how do we continue to drive right, the focus in this particular space? Uh, because I think there's a lot of great things that, that are sort of there or thereabouts. We just need to do the last mile, but it's usually the hardest part of the journey. Uh, I think as the one B to C in yeah, the group, it's, 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 it's um, for all consumers. I, I'm really <laughs> bullish on it because I think you know there's exciting technology coming out. There's interesting changes in consumer behavior, um, but for the better. I, I really do see like certainly what we do. We're we're kind of sorting through all the complexity for a consumer to deliver something that is seamless and. We're able to do that because of new emergent technologies. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see what keeps coming out. Yeah, I think, look, there's no song AI makes the world go round. There is a song money makes the world yeah. go round, and that hasn't changed with AI, <laughs> right? I think ultimately FinTech is going to be here. It's FinTech is still core to everything we do in business. I think that there's plenty of things that are massively broken. There's lots of opportunity. And I think we can make the world a more efficient, efficient place with AI or without AI. Uh, I mean, I would, I would add in addition to what we just said, one of the things that may be more on the concerning side is we have for a very long time created a very global uh, world and companies go global faster than they ever did before, as we said before. But there's a counter to that that start to happen. There's regulation coming in where maybe there's regulation that actually protects the local companies, or in some cases, as long as they're not American brand, everything is fine, as happened in Europe. Uh, uh, or there are other drivers, hey, this is really critical infrastructure from, from a domestic policy and politics perspective. So we're actually going to make barriers and making it a lot harder for companies to operate in a global environment. And that makes it, if nothing else, a lot more expensive and time consuming to do what was maybe a few years ago a lot easier. Amazing. Well, let's give it up for these amazing panelists. Um, this was great.